good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you Ed, for the introduction, and um, particularly I think to Suzanne for organising things and for all the other people who are behind it. I think to Triona and Car um, Claire from Boringer who've been uh, very active as well in giving support to the meeting. But for everybody, well, thank you all for coming out. It's my pleasure to talk to you a little bit about uh, lung health and exercise. And I just think we're in a beautiful room here, which uh, I've never been in this room before, and I've been very impressed by the colours and so on. And actually, it really brings up the first point, and that is we, we all have team colours. These are family names, and so families have family name crests and colours. And the same we all have. Either you're a dub, or you're a caring member, you go to Crow Park, or wherever you're from, or you wear Premiership Football Club colours, whatever, whatever it is. But we have those that idea of our colours. And doctors and nurses and physios are the same. We have our team colours too. So if we were at a different meeting, I could be, for example, a gastroenterologist, and I would tell you how important the bowel is and you spend the next couple of hours listening to people talking about diarrhea and um, <laughs> passing wind and, and very interesting things like that. So in fact, you're in the group of, of people who are interested in the lung, and that's our colour. We think, actually, that the lung is the best organ of them all. You can even hear with pride how Dr. Ed McKeown talks about the lung. You can float on water. There are many things that can do that. <laughs> so we're proud of our organ, and we know how special it is. So I'm going to, uh, I suppose, share with you a little bit about how special it is, both in health and in disease and in high performance. I'll just give you an idea of what the lung can do, and that's really, uh, I think, uh, if we can leave here today knowing just how powerful the organ it can be, I think that's some achievement. This is actually a cast of the airways of the lung, and it really is very much like a tree that's been inverted. And I want you to think of it that way, because each of the branches in your lung, as the air goes down first through the trachea, then the bronchi, then the bronchioles, it keeps branching and branching and branching like a tree does, down to the leaves. But instead of leaves, it branches down to the alveoli. And it can go down um, to such a degree that if you were to lay out all the little passageways in your <coughs> lungs, it would actually be a distance of about 1,500 miles. You could lay them all the way out from Dublin down to, the, the, to Sicily. So that's how much airways and, and branching that actually occurs in there. And then we go down to the end, to the alveoli. That's like the leaves. That's where all the, uh, where all the, the action occurs and oxygenation and blood and so on. And then here, here's an example of it. In fact, if you can see, this is the, the airway coming down here, and this is actually a, a microscopic image uh, of somebody's airway. And you can see it comes down like this, and then it goes into these small little alveoli. Okay? There are about 300 million of those alveoli. And it looks for all the world like, a, I'd say, like a, an aero bar or something like that, you know? So it goes down into those, and if I were to look really closely, see the way there's kind of these circles here? Those are the alveoli. The air is in there, and the blood vessels are all around the outside of that. So the aero bar, the substance of the aero bar, or the crunchy is made up of the blood vessels. So that in fact, it looks something like this. These are the little, um, these are the blood vessels here that are coming through, these are the capillaries. And here and here you'll see the actual um, blood, red blood cells that are traipsing through it. Okay, so that's actually what's happening. Blood is flowing and air and blood get to come together. And the membrane between those is incredibly small. It's much smaller than, uh, say, one-tenth the thickness of a human hair would be the membrane. There really is no, there's no cloth that we make that would be as thin as the membrane that's there between the red blood cells uh, and, and the airway. And if you look a little bit closer, how big is that? Well, if you, if you actually took those membranes and you laid them all out, and took that big membrane and laid it out, it would be the size of a tennis court. And that is vitally important so that the air and the blood can mix. And you can see like this, the air will be at the top of the tennis court in the sense of the surface, and the blood goes underneath. And it's fine, as I said, one tenth thickness of the human hair, but the oxygen and can go across, and then more importantly as well, the carbon dioxide can be exhaled off. <coughs> so that's quite a remarkable job that the, uh, that the lungs do. It's also interesting because, as we've heard, we're also exposing all of this to the atmosphere, to chemicals, to things that we breathe in and dust. And it's interesting. It's one of the reasons why cigarettes are so addictive. When you take a drive on a cigarette, it goes straight down to that membrane, the smoke layers out over that tennis court, and all the chemicals can just drop across that membrane. It's so thin that it'll stop nothing. And really, the only thing that actually stops is red blood cells from coming out of the opposite side, otherwise we cough up blood all the time. So that's what, and I often think about people, you go to the fridge and you take out a piece of meat and you see that it's one day old, so I'm not gonna eat that, or the yogurt is one day old, or milk, and you say, I wouldn't eat that, I'd never touch that. And yet you'd walk into a dusty environment, or uh, you'd walk and stand behind the back of a bus with diesel fumes coming out of it, yeah. Or you'd smoke a cigarette. You say, oh, I'm really care about my, my health. But we don't care necessarily about what it is we put into our lungs. And I think some of the advice that we're giving today is we really should.
For example, I think there's a lot of a move in Ireland today to move from petrol cars to diesel. Well, that might reduce the, the problems with the ozone there, but diesel is a, is a dirty exhaust. And in fact, diesel produces particles. Those particles go into the lung, they cross that membrane, and they go in, and actually people who live close to big busy roads have an increased risk of heart attacks and lung disease and so on because of diesel. So diesel, while it might be more efficient, is dirtier. And this is what happens to your lungs if you're in that kind of environment. The one on the right hand side here is somebody uh, who is in living in the country, well away from uh, uh, bad air. The one on the left would be for Mary Harney got rid of the, the smokeless fuel, got the smokeless fuels into Dublin. That's what your lungs would have been like, or if you're a heavy smoker. So all of those chemicals and things that you breathe in, they, they get in there and they get stuck into the lungs. And that's the difference really between a city and a, a country dweller. The air quality in Ireland, as you know, has substantially improved over the last uh, number of years, so the lungs aren't quite as dark if you're not a smoker anymore. So what do the lungs actually do? So it's interesting, if we think about what is like a car, this is a car here, we say, you have an engine in your car, and the engine moves the wheels, and the lung is part of your engine. And in fact, the engine that you have is made up of your heart, that's the pump, and it's made up of your lungs, that's kind of the filter that brings in the, the oxygen, and it's also made up of your muscles, and that the muscles extract then glucose from the blood, oxygen that's coming in the blood as well, the two of them combust and you can move and do the things that you want to do. So oxygen, glucose, and moving it around the body. And the, each of these are vitally important. So if someone says to me, I'm breathless, I'm thinking, well, it's one of these three things that's broken, or all three, but that's why you get breathless. You're either breathless because your heart isn't pumping efficiently, because your lungs aren't working properly, or your muscles are not working properly. Maybe perhaps, for example, if they're unfit, or something has happened and they can't extract the blood. And it's interesting, gents, and um, we're going to go back again. Um, i just say to you that um, Sonia Sullivan, for example, fantastic athlete, great lungs, great heart, but if she stayed in bed for the winter and wasn't able to get out or get around the place, and then in January came or February decided to go run up the stairs, she'd be breathless. Perfect heart, perfect lungs, but the muscles would be inefficient and no longer able to take the oxygen out in an efficient manner. So that's just a little bit about breathlessness and the lungs are part of it. But if we think about an engine, we all know the power of an engine. For example, you've written on the side of the engine or the back of the car, 3.6 litres, 5 litres, whatever it might be for the size of an engine. But it turns out that the human body has a combustion engine in it as well. And we recognise Dr. Ronald Delaney here winning in the, um, the, the gold medal. And if he were a car, you'd see him have a little badge on the side saying his power output. And we were just speculating beforehand. I speculated that the size of his engine would be quite enormous. Uh, to have done what he, had, what he did at the time with, without all the sophistication of modern training techniques that people would have and so on, he was able to run uh, and break records uh, and, and uh, achieve what he did because he had that combustion engine, uh, uh, like the engine in the car, that was quite special. And I've marked it off there, his VO2 max is what we call it. <laughs> and in fact, we sometimes measure VO2 max in people to find out how is that combustion engine working. We do it for patients sometimes, if we have a patient who's breathless, and we're not sure why. We bring them in, and we actually can put them on this machine where we measure the breathe, measure the heart, measure the output of the heart. We'll be able to measure how much oxygen is used, how much carbon dioxide is given off. And we do that for patients, but we also do it for athletes. And in fact, if you look at athletes, they come out here with different levels of VO2 max. And as you can see one up here, Lance Armstrong had a VO2 max of 85, very powerful. Now we know he was involved in doping, but he had a very natural, very high VO2 max anyway. Doping by giving blood products increased the amount of oxygen he carried around his, his body. And away at the top here, you'll see you have sled dogs, husky dogs that have an incredibly high combustion engine for their heart and lungs. And I'll mention them again in a moment. So, so this is kind of like having your NCT done, you're measuring uh, how much exhaust you give off and how much petrol you use and whether it's all very efficient. Here's the interesting part about that though. When you see a scene like that, where there's the combustion engine has run to exhaustion. And the person might say, God, my lungs were killing me. Uh, I didn't have enough breath or whatever. It, generally speaking, in most cases, it's not the lungs that limits people. The lungs have an enormous capacity. And you heard about that from Dr. Edward Young. They can do an enormous amount. They can bring in, as you saw, 200 litres uh, of, uh, of uh, air per minute in heavy end exercise in elite athletes. The, the reason why athletes will come to the end of a run like this often is because they can no longer maintain the cardiac output and blood sufficiently to supply the muscles with the oxygen it requires to them. The muscle, therefore, is starved of oxygen, and what does it do? It releases 
lactic acid and so on. It's, it's no longer able to get the oxygen. And that lactic acid then has to be blown off as carbon dioxide, but it causes the muscles to ache and so on, and it's a sign that you've really reached the maximum that your body can actually do. And so, believe it or not, the lungs are very, very uh, the limiting uh, step in people's achievement. Now that's in the normal circumstance, but what about when you've got some lung disease or there, there, there's something, your lungs aren't 100%? Well, in many cases, that doesn't matter either. And I'm just going to give you a couple of examples of people who come out, Irish athletes, who said, I'm an asthmatic, and I've been able to perform at the highest level, Roland O'Garrell and Dennis Hickey, for example, uh, John O'Shea and uh, Peter Canada. These are people who come out and said, I'm an asthmatic, I have severe asthma, I got treated for it, and guess what? I'm able to perform at the highest level uh, now. So even when there are problems with delivery of, uh, of uh, oxygen to the alveoli and so on, with modern therapies, we can still get people to perform at the highest level uh, with problems with the lung. And in fact, if we just look at the Olympic Games itself, back in Los Angeles, only 1.7% of those who were competing were designated as asthmatic at the time. And it's increased every uh, Olympic Games really since then. And in Beijing, it was 8.5%, which is just about what it should be if you take the normal population, how many people would have asthma in the normal population. And so it really means that with better treatments, now, more people with asthma, for example, can compete and compete at the very highest levels at the Olympic Games. A little bit about exercise in the lung, though. People often ask me, I've got a bit of a chest infection, can I go out and do my running, can I do my jogging? When, when can you or can't you? And this is an interesting one. I was telling you about the Alaskan sled dogs, that they're very, very, they have a huge output. And a dog who's pulling a sled behind them will go across in freezing cold air in Alaska, for example. And they'll run at about 20, 35 kilometers an hour. Uh, they'll go distances about 200 kilometers, and they'll pull huge weights behind. So they do an enormous amount of work. But if you put a bronchoscope down and look at their airways, and have a look at them before they go running, and then you look at them a thousand miles later when they're finished running across, uh, uh, running across the, the snow, they have an awful lot of damage to their airways. And it's interesting, those little hairs that uh, Dr. McKeown was showing me that with the hair is removed. Those will get injured after a while. The cold air continuously coming across it, they get a little bit bruised, they get a little bit of mucus on it, can't cope completely with it. And actually, if you look at these guys, about half of them have quite severe bronchitis by the time they get to the opposite side. And they'll recover fairly quickly. But it's just an example. I always think for patients, particularly someone with asthma, look, if you've got a cold, if it's below the neck, rest. If it's above the neck, you can go on and keep going with things. But don't, don't, uh, Let's keep the lungs healthy and don't overwork them. They're very, very good, but you have to bathe them along sometimes and take care of them. That's, what, that's something that the sled dogs teach us. Well, that's a little bit about sport and the things about airways for a second, but then I often think most of the time I spend is not actually with Olympic athletes at all, but it's in the manner possible of taking care of patients with lung disease. And you might think, well, on the one hand, you have someone like Sonia O'Sullivan here, you know, fantastic athlete, and then the other part of the day, you might be taking care of somebody who's sitting there who's really quite frail and has maybe COPD uh, or maybe has some asthma or has some of the other lung diseases. And you think, isn't that it's a huge contrast? But actually, I'd make a comment to you that there's a lot more similarities than you can imagine between athletes and people who have underlying lung disease and in hospitals and so on. For a start, here's an interesting little graph that I can explain it to you, is that if you look at, at athletes, bring this in here. If you look at athletes, you look at someone who's sedentary and then compare them with someone who's doing a moderate amount of exercise or someone who's doing too much exercise, who's not giving it their bodies a chance to recover and so on. Oh, if you overdo things, you actually can depress your immune system a little bit and put you at more risk, not only for injury and so on, uh, but for diseases and coughs and colds and flu. So athletes at the highest end cannot be quite frail in a sense. They have, they're more susceptible often to simple things that occur around them. And that's not that dissimilar to someone who has an underlying problem, say, in their health and with their lungs. And another aspect of that, I think is interesting, is because of that, the biggest message we brought to London for the Olympic Games for our Irish athletes was hand washing and alcohol gels and avoiding infection. Because you can imagine that. You trained for four years, maybe ten years, for a lifetime to compete for your country at the Olympic Games, and you're not careful about hand washing, you pick up something flu or cold from somebody, or an old common cold even, you can't perform to your best and you've ruined a great opportunity and so on. So how do you avoid it? And that was a really important part. It's the same message for all of us who are involved in lung disease or people who have lung disease. Hand washing, 
vaccinations, flu vaccinations, pneumococcal vaccinations, seven to five years. These are messages we're bringing to the athletes, the same messages we're bringing to people with lung disease. And in fact, athletes know this for quite some time, and it, it happened particularly in the Tour de France, you guys who were cycling for 3,000 uh, kilometers over three weeks, 100, 200 kilometers a day of uh, alpine mountains, they can't get the infection. They're extremely vulnerable. Their immune systems are much lower than they should be because of what they're going through. And they don't shake hands. In fact, they, they do this thing of the elbow bump. And this is an example of uh, some athletes in the US and, and baseball team. But elbow bumping, we don't use your hand. You might fist or you might elbow, but you don't use your hands. And that really has become a big part of athletes that do, uh, in, in certain sports. And it's something we all should be thinking of a little bit more, particularly when it comes into the winter time and uh, when flus are going around and we're all susceptible to them. But another thing about athletes and about people with lung disease that are quite similar is this thing about muscle, that staying strong. In fact, when I see somebody with COPD, for example, and emphysema, one of the first things I look at is their legs. I want to see their quadriceps. I want to see that their quadriceps are strong. Somebody who has very weak quadriceps, they have increased susceptibility. They're weaker there, and they're not as strong to be able to go into the winter and face problems. But it doesn't have to be that way. There are things that we can do over time to prevent some of the muscle wasting that occurs. This here is a 25-year-old's muscle, so I simply buy down in the, uh, in the butchers. Uh, it's, the, it's the legs with, the, with your quads as well. If you look up here, the next image is uh, somebody at age 63. What you see is muscle begins to diminish, and it's replaced in a sense there by increasing amounts of fat. And the important thing in staying strong and staying healthy for everyone, particularly people with lung disease, is to try and maintain as much as possible the image on the left-hand side. And you're going to hear a little bit more about that uh, shortly, because we found over the years uh, that exercise is a hugely important part of maintaining good lung health. And when you do have lung disease, in improving your chances of fighting off problems when they arise. And I know Michelle is going to talk to us uh, very shortly about what she does in St. Michael's and the Leary Group Rehab, and it's vitally important for us all to, to play a role in that. So what else can Olympic athletes teach us? Here's Durban O'Rourke, and Durban has also come out as, and said she's an asthmatic, and yet she's able to compete at the, at the very highest uh, levels in the world. But one of the things I think about athletes that can teach us with lung disease or with people who have lung disease is goals. Athletes set goals, and they're very rigorous about how to carry out those goals. And so they'll set a goal, but, but someone with lung, with lung problems might set a goal and say, now I'm confined to my house, I can't really move around very much. My target is, I just want to be able to walk around to the shops or walk around to mass, or I want to be able to do something like that. When do I want to do it? I want to do it uh, this summer, for example. And they'll set a goal ahead. For example, if you want to run the marathon, you don't say I'm going to run it on the 1st of October and do it on the 30th of October. You say you're going to do it this time of the year when you build up over the year, and then with three months to go, you pick up your amount of training that you do for it. And it has to be the same for simple goals for people who have lung disease. You know, how am I going to do it? Well, I'm going to build a little bit, you know, put together a plan of how I'm going to achieve it. And one of the things athletes do is they set goals, they, but they also rest. They give time to recovery. They don't push themselves every single day. They take time to rest, to recover, and then they reward themselves. If they've done something, they'll take time and a break from it. We should do the same with the lung disease. <coughs> Just want to mention New Frontier that's coming. It's not there yet for mainstream, but nutrition is really important. We're learning more and more about the simple things about foods, and athletes are way ahead of us on this. Athletes now are drinking enormous amounts of beetroot juice, for example. There's a lot of evidence that the nitrates in beetroot juice is important for performance. You'll find that in green teas, for example, they're antioxidants. If they're in a concentrated format, improve performance. There's uh, vitamin D. We're all deficient in vitamin D. The Dublin team was checked in a study uh, last year, and almost all the Dublin players, who you can imagine big, strong men, they're vitamin D deficient in, 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 uh, in the wintertime. They're not getting enough sunlight. And Ireland's obviously very poor at that. But vitamin D has anti inflammatory effects. It may be very important in building strength and stopping our muscles from wasting. And the same way with some of the fish oils omega-3 fatty acids and so on. Again, these things are going to be antioxidants, they can be anti-inflammatories. In the future, I suspect we'll spend a lot more time, now we're focusing on exercise, and it's really important. But in a few years' time, we've got a lot more evidence about the importance of good nutrition, and focused nutrition for fighting lung disease. And then the final thing we learned from athletes is the importance of good coach. And, and that a good coach for an athlete is a very, very important thing, but a good coach for someone with lung disease it's just, it could be their spouse, it could be their son or daughter, it could be an next door neighbor, it's somebody to encourage them along the way. It's really hard to try and fight lung problems or health problems anyway on your own and to see a reason for why you're doing it and, and, to, get, and to see that what progress you've made. So 
So having a good coach. So for us here, some of us would be coaches for people with lung disease. Some of us would have lung disease and wish for coaches and so on. So it's a really important thing. Athletes find it vital, and, uh, and, and it is. So just to, to summarize a little bit, so I want to hope that you wear the colors of the lung. The lung is a remarkable organ. You've heard a little bit about that. I think you'll agree. It does a remarkable amount of work, both in health and in illness. Um, it's vulnerable, though. It needs to be taken care of. It needs to be taken care of by vaccination, by hand washing, it needs to be taken by, by not smoking, but also to be paying attention to environmental issues. Environmental issues in Ireland, we've moved off thinking we were on a green path by going to diesel, but we're not. We're actually going to get ourselves into more trouble in the longer term, probably by the amount of diesel that we have. And a lot of the benefits we've had from having smokeless fuels, we lose uh, by, by that move. In elite athletes, um, the lung rarely limits performance. So uh, the lung is a remarkable, huge amount of reserve. But even if you have asthma, that in and of itself may not or should not be enough to limit your performance. However, if you've got more severe lung disease, COP or emphysema or fibrosis and so on, sure, you're not going to be able to perform at the highest level, but you can still have the same goals and aspirations and plans that are on a different level. But they're your goals and they're your aspirations. Um, and exercise is probably the most untouched drug, non-drug, that we have to treat people who have uh, lung disease. I'm going to hear more about